Warm welcome to today's talk. It's Friday the 7th of January. Hope you caught the last video on the change of post because it's no longer possible to stop Omicron. So we've changed to this new uh, in infographic poster. Now today I want to look at the surge of cases in the United States and the United Kingdom. This is unstoppable. We can modify it a little bit. We could slow it down a bit. It'll take longer to get around everyone, but we can't stop it now. This Omicron wave is now inevitable that we are all, basically, we are all going to be exposed to it. Many of us won't suffer from it. Many will be asymptomatic. The vast majority will have minimal disease, most often as a common cold. Some people will feel pretty sick for two, three days. A minority of people will require hospital care. But that's what we're looking at today now. Let's look at some data first of all. So here we have uh, the world cases. This is from Our World in Data. This is all over the world, the whole world, and we can see there's a big Omicron spike, bigger than any of the previous waves by quite a long way, as basically, as we've said, everyone in the world is being exposed to Omicron. This is deaths, as the Omicron cases have gone up, deaths have gone down. So we see the high deaths in previous waves, and now we see that deaths are still declining in this age of the Omicron variant. New daily confirmed COVID-19 cases per million. Well, we do see this upward trend. And this is going to continue for about another two weeks is what the data is showing. Another two to three weeks is going to peak at the end of January. Then hospitalizations are going to peak in February. And, and that's looking fairly sure now. I think we can say that with some confidence. But let's carry on sticking to the data. So increase in cases, remember this is diagnosed cases rather than infections. Diagnosed cases being a subset of the total number of infections. Canada, Netherlands, um, United States, Netherlands bounced. Th th this here in Netherlands was Delta, so they've come from Delta straight on to Omicron. United States, Omicron, Australia, Omicron. Interesting now, cases uh, in Australia despite the difficulty of testing in Australia, but there again, there's difficulty in testing in America. So, so these cases in Australia and uh, the United States are gross underestimates of the actual number of infections because of the great difficulty with testing logistics. But despite that, these are actual diagnosed cases. So the real numbers we can say are at least twice as high. United Kingdom, now cases are still going up in the United Kingdom, but not going up as quickly. That's the key point. Ireland still remarkably high. And of course, Ireland is a highly vaccinated nation and yet with very high numbers of uh, diagnosed cases. Hospital patients, Netherlands still going down as it recovers from its Delta wave. Australia is going up, but it's not that high in Australia yet. It is going up, though. Um, Ireland data is still somewhat incomplete. Canada, somewhat of an increase. United Kingdom, it's increasing. It's not at critical levels yet. The main problem in the United Kingdom and the reason why the 200 military personnel have been drafted into hospitals in London that I've heard of so far is because of staff sickness. This is the real problem. So many staff are isolating. And, and about half of the staff that are off sick are isolating because of Omicron exposure. So this is the real problem at the moment. Uh, United States um, hospitalizations have been remained high and have gone up, and this is partly because of the uh, the comorbidities in the United States, and the, uh, the the obesity and unmanaged hypertension and other chronic problems like that that often not that well managed in many segments of society in the United States. Now, this graphic here is the uh, reproduction rate, the R number. Now, here's the here's one. So anything above this, numbers are increasing. So as we can see, numbers are increasing now. Even when the line starts to go down here, as in the case of the United Kingdom, this is still a positive R value. So this represents still uh, an exponential increase in cases. It's just the rate of increase is not as rapid. So the R value is down from about 1.4 to about 1.2 or thereabouts. But it's the cases are still increasing, just that the rate of increase is not as dramatic, but they are still increasing. So we can say the cases are going to carry on increasing, we believe, at least for, even if the line goes down to here, the cases will still be increasing because it's got to go below this line here for the cases to start decreasing. So Netherlands will carry on increasing, United Kingdom will. 
Canada, again, the rate of increase has gone down somewhat. Ireland and the United States, the rate of increase has increased. And Australia, um, it's flattening off according to that data. People in Australia are very keen to tell me that the approach in Australia is very different in different parts. It's the New South Wales, Sydney area that seems to be saying let it rip, whereas other parts of Australia are being uh, more conservative. Now, let's just go on to look at some data now from uh, the United States. New York hospitals, how this is transposing into hospitalizations. Well, um, incidental positives. In other words, people that are admitted to hospital and found to be positive from Omicron for other reasons are 50% in some hospitals in New York and up to 65% in others. So quite variable. So this emergency care physician, we are seeing an increase in, hosp in number of, numbers of hospitalizations, but the severity of the disease looks different from previous waves. This is not as severe as previous waves. Dr. Shamira goes on. We're not sending as many patients to the ICU. We're not intubating, putting tubes down the trachea as many patients. And actually, most of our patients are coming to the emergency department. Uh, they get tested and basically they get sent home. So that's pretty good news, really. Um, so these cases are not transposing into hospitalizations the way they have done in previous waves. Now, I want to look at some more data from the United States now, which gives projections. This is from the... Um, Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, reference given, of course. So daily infections, and um, this is roughly where we are now. So we can see they are going to carry on going up. This assumes 85% of the population wear masks. I don't think the effect will be as dramatic as that with Omicron, to be quite honest. But that's their, that's their modelling. Um, so this is basically what's going to happen. So cases are here now. They're going to go on increasing up until what? About the third week in January. So by the 1st of February, the number of cases, not the rate of growth, the actual number of cases in the United States will be declining and it will go on declining throughout February up until the 1st of March. And then by the 1st of April, the cases will be declining even further. And I must say, this is roughly what we've been thinking on this channel for, um, well, a good few weeks now, actually, a good few weeks. Hospital use in the United States, how's that going to pan out? Well, again, it's definitely going to go up. And th this model actually thinks there's going to be an increase in ICU bed admissions. Now, so far, this is not what we're seeing. It's not what we're seeing. Um, so let's hope this is overly pessimistic. Again, a close up on that. Overall hospitalisation. So we're looking at ma mass ma maximum increase in cases here, end of January. Maximum hospitalisations, middle of February. Then pressure is going to ease. So make no mistake, there is going to be a fairly difficult time in terms of hospitalizations in the States, especially. And we've seen the hospitalization in the States have remained high. Uh, deaths in the United States, again, an optimistic scenario. Th this scenario here assumes that Omicron is going to be uh, quite severe, but I don't think that's going to happen. So this is roughly where we're going to get. There's going to be some increase in deaths up to around about the 2000 a day mark. And then it's going to fall off to uh, into April. And again, that's a closer up view of that. So maximum deaths are going to occur in the middle of February in the uh, in the United States. And I think this will be the last winter, but it's going to be a difficult one in the States. This is certainly in the States. Uh, just to give a couple of localized uh, illustrations. This is California. Uh, the uh, yeah, this is California. The increasing cases in unvaccinated, but vaccinated cases are increasing as well. Of course, um, that's the data from California. Increasing cases. This is the data from New York. Um, now, this is percentage here, and this is total numbers on this side. So, these 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 grey bars here are the delta. So we can see that the size of the delta bars are getting smaller. In terms of percentage, yes but in terms of overall numbers as well. So the latest data we have is that Delta is only about 4% of cases here uh, in New York. That's the latest data we have there. That means all these cases are Omicron and that represents 95.7% of cases are now Omicron. 
So because the Omicron bars are getting bigger and because the Delta bars are getting smaller, we can now definitively say that in the United States, as was the case in the United Kingdom, that Omicron is replacing Delta. And of course, this is remarkably good news. This is exactly uh, what we would want, that we're getting the less pathogenic um, Omicron and we're getting less of the more pathogenic Delta. But the sheer numbers, because it's all happening, everyone's going to be exposed, virtually everyone's going to be exposed by the, not most of us by the end of January, pretty well the rest of us by the end of February, and a few stragglers by the end of March, April, we're going to be exposed to this. Now, what about other countries? Let's look at another example here. So this is a good example here from France. This is one of the leading... Uh, medical authorities in France. Uh, I think we are coming to the peak of this new wave primarily towards the beginning of the second fortnight in January. So again, the next week or two, France is going to peak. So it looks like the Omicron uh, tsunami in France is roughly keeping time with the one in the UK. Again, it's what we've been predicting for about a month now. Um, so if we work it out, this would be in around 10 days time. So 10 days, a couple of weeks time, we're going to reach the peak. But then it will start going down. And even though the reproduction rate is going to go down, the numbers are still going to be there. So there's still going to be some people. So that's probably going to be, say, uh, the beginning of February. That's probably going to be, be the beginning of March. Uh, but cases won't be right down till about the beginning of uh, April. But there is going to be this rapid drop off and the peak really quite uh, the peak really quite soon now massive numbers of people are going to be exposed I, I probably I don't know if I've been exposed or not so far I haven't tested positive I, I just test myself when I have symptoms or if I think I'm going to I've, I've got about five tests left so I have to be a little more sparing with them but um, um, so far but there again, I've had three doses of vaccine, so I could well not get the infection. I'm still going to have a three doses of vaccine. I'm going to have a re, about a 40 percent less, 40 uh, percent protection from any infection at all. Latest data from the UK: if someone's had uh, three doses of vaccine, their chances of being hospitalised are 88 percent less than someone who's not vaccinated at all. Uh, but of course, virtually everyone's got some antibody exposure in the UK now, so not many people would have that relative risk. Now I want to look at some data from the Office for National Statistics. Uh, that's this one here from the UK. This has just come out today and this shows the difference in uh, age ranges. So we've seen a big increase in the 12 to 24 year old age groups. Um, the 35 to 49 year old age groups flattened off. The younger age group 25 to 34 flattened off. But we are seeing now an increase in the 50 to 69s projected here. As we can see, this is projected to carry on going up. And of course, this is one of the groups that are more prone to hospitalisation. And likewise, in the oldest age group, um, again, projected to go up. So this is quite a strong proviso, really, that the cases so far in the UK have been mostly the younger age groups. So how are we likely to fare altogether? Well, so far, so far, as we more or less predicted, the London data, which of course is leading the way in the UK, is closely mirroring the South Africa pattern three, four weeks ago. We did anticipate this. We, we had provisos around it, but it, it does seem to be following it. So let's look at the South Africa data. Uh, cases, so... Um, B11 wave, the original Wuhan virus, the alpha wave, the delta wave, and the Omicron wave. Right up, but then down really quite quickly. And this is genuine. The cases are dropping off like this in South Africa. Now, how is this transposed to death? So that, that's the first wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave. Let's look at the deaths. Well, there we go. Just Let's just flick back again. That's the Omicron wave there. That's the death. So we see deaths for the B11 wave, the first wave, the second wave, the beta wave, the delta wave, and the deaths for the Omicron wave remarkably low. Now, there could be, a, well, there will be a few deaths still to come. 
um, but we believe not that many. So this is the very low levels of death induced by the Omicron wave compared to the Delta, compared to the Beta, compared to the original Wuhan strain. I think that really kind of zooming in on that graphic kind of brings it to uh, to life a bit. Very low overall uh, death rates. And let's just check on the hospitalizations in South Africa. Well, they are well down. So this is this is virtually complete data now for the first week in 2022. That is complete data from the last week in uh, 2021. So we see the peak there down on week 51, week 52 the last week down, first week of the new year down quite significantly. This, as I say, this may go up a little bit. Uh, the, these different colours represent private and uh, public sectors in South Africa. I can't remember which is which, but these are the overall levels of hospitalisation. So relatively good. And if we look at the people actually in hospital at the moment, Again, this is today's data, currently in hospital, under 9,000, diagnosed with uh, SARS coronavirus 2 in South Africa. Um, and we see the numbers for intensive care and high care. Uh, 1,300 people in the entire country of South Africa, currently requiring oxygen. Just incredible. V very, very low. And we know about half of these patients in South Africa that are hospitalised um, are there we were just discovered to be positive when they were hospitalised for other reasons. So still thinking about hospitalisations, David Spiegelhalter, um, one of the leading statisticians in the United Kingdom, uh, professor for the public understanding of risk <laughs> um, in uh, Cambridge, I think he's in Cambridge. Anyway, um, there's still no sign of serious increase in intensive care, ventilation and deaths. And we would have expected to see that by now. It would have been there by now. Unless for some really mysterious reason, there's like a six week delay on getting Omicron and then <laughs> getting um, severe infection. But that's not that's not happening. We know it's not happening. Hospitalised in England with good luck, they won't go over 3000, which, of course, was the sage, uh, the sage sort of upper estimate back in December was was uh, hopefully not go no more than 3000 if we carry on with plan B. And it does look like for one sage might be actually correct on that. They've had a mixed record so far, but maybe they'll finish the pandemic on a better note. Uh, this is down to the fact that people have been voluntarily cautious about their behaviour. Have they? I can't say I've noticed that particularly, but if David Spiegelhalter says so, we'll accept it. London peaked on the 31st of December. So Professor Spiegelhalter is clearly saying that the uh, pandemic, the Omicron in London, has peaked. And let's look at the hospitalizations in London here. London's hospital admissions fell below 400, the 400 per day line. Now that's the 400 per day line there, uh, admissions, and they are going down. The number of people actually in hospital in London is about the same, but this is a downward trajectory. And given that the numbers of cases in London have gone down, I would expect that to carry on going down further. And of course, we've already noted <clears throat> that there's not much uh, the, the, the intensive care uh, pe people with COVID in intensive care in the UK has basically stayed flat in London. It went up a little bit, but not really very much at all. And that's despite relatively lower vaccination rates in London. So pretty encouraging, really. Now, I want to just finish off with the Zoe data. Uh, this is the Zoe study here. Um, Tim Spector's uh, lead on the COVID symptom tracker data. Uh, new cases in the UK. So R is about 1.1 on this data up to the 3rd of Jan on the 3rd of January. Here's the increase. Now we can see that the increase here was sharpest because the line's going up steepest and you, and you can see that the dots are further apart. Now the dots are closer together. So it is still increasing, but the rate of increase has decreased. So the R value is probably still 1.1. So that is clearly an increase, but a slower rate of increase. Now, this is new cases amongst doubly vaccinated people in the UK, amongst all people. Now, this is not vaccinated versus unvaccinated. This is two doses of vaccine at least versus um, everyone altogether. So so th th these people are a subset of this total, total one here. 
But what we clearly see is people that are doubly vaccinated are getting symptomatic infection to the tune of, well, what's that? That's uh, to the tune of 90,000 a day. Um, they are, and of course, this study is dealing with uh, symptomatic infection. So clearly, uh, vaccinated people are getting symptomatic infections. But having said that, the total number, which includes the unvaccinated, of course, are getting more infections. So we see some protection against symptomatic disease. Um, but we still believe that the people that are doubly vaccinated, even though they're getting symptomatic disease, is the symptoms aren't as bad and they don't last for as long. Now, this is also interesting and th this is the main cause of concern at the moment this is the big unknown at the moment age groups so we know it went up in the 18 to 35 quite dramatically we saw that here but up until recently this 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 line here is the 55 to 75 that's actually went down a bit but now that's going up as it is in the over 75s and of course these are the groupings that we believe are more likely to go to hospital so um, we could see a pressure from this age group on hospitalizations. Although um, so far, um, the data we're getting is that it's not a huge problem, even in older people, compared, nothing like compared to what it was anyway. So that's some interesting data uh, peaking soon in terms of number of cases in the next two or three weeks in the UK, in Europe and in the United States, but carrying on for some time after that, but going, the number of new cases starting to decline after that point. But there's still going to be plenty of us getting in, most of us are going to be probably infected by January, but still quite a few of us getting infected in February, March. So just be, uh, be, be, ready, for, be ready for that. Um, I did have a few, um, I've just got a few, a few notes here, this is quite interesting. Um, Nic Nicholas, um, talking about yesterday's uh, video. As someone who studied uh, genetics and evolutionary biology, um, sars coronavirus 2 is not behaving like other viruses in its genus, actually meaning the origins are likely from labs. Nic Nicholas thinks this, uh, I don't know. We need to consider this hypothesis very seriously because this is a potential for modern warfare and bioterrorism. It is really strange the way that Omicron has come to our rescue just, just at the right time. Uh, Ghost writes, uh, now, someone else, now someone else still has some uh, specimens of the Wuhan strain and may decide to experiment on it to make more transmissive, but at the same time less pathogenic, viruses less, less pathogenic. In other words, what, what, what Ghost is saying here is, is saying that Someone's probably got hold of the original virus, the B11 from Wuhan. That is possible. And he's saying that just as people did, allegedly, did, or may or may not have done gain-of-function research, it's a controversial issue, uh, could people have done reduction-of-function research to actually make a viable saviour? To tell you the truth, I don't think people are that clever, but it's an interesting idea. Then release it in South Africa, knowing it will outcompete Delta, which animals might have uh, been used in a laboratory, which animals might have been used in a laboratory setting to make a new variant, which animals might have been used in a laboratory to make a new variant. I wonder if it could have been mice. Maybe that's what uh, Ghost is thinking, but of course it sounds like it's uh, very cynical. Now, have I got some... Um, I think I have some more... Um, interesting quotes somewhere but I don't seem to have printed them off oh yes I have here we are very important to keep your papers in the, in the right uh, piles so mice are used in large numbers in lab research in coronaviruses it's true they are they are Wuhan Institute of Virology used uh, so-called humanized mice and we did look at this genes from humans that are put into mice and I expressed discomfort with that um Strange correlation, why mice? Next lab leak will destroy humanity. Let's hope not, but th this is, these are serious issues. This is why I'm reading them out. Uh, Rich talks about a fourth hypothesis, hypothesis for the origin. If engineering a virus for a gain of function, wouldn't it make sense also to engineer a virus with loss of function? That is highly infectious as a safety valve. Interesting. So in a future pandemic... 
could we have a virus which is circulating, which is transmissible and very pathogenic, then engineer a virus which is less pathogenic but more transmissible that will outcompete it. And instead of vaccinating the planet, expose the whole planet to a virus which is less pathogenic but more transmissible, using one virus to protect us against another virus. Very interesting idea, Rich. Very interesting idea. Uh, Ed, fourth hypothesis again. Omicron was created in a lab using lab mice, engineered to give the combination of high transmissibility and low sensitivity. So a lot of people are saying the same thing. Nancy, sounds like more gain of function where they used humanized mice. Um, we, we don't have the data to answer this. And Dwight says that explains my sudden urge for cheese. So um, quite a few of you, well, hundreds of you actually, <laughs> probably about a thousand wrote in uh, to say that it just seems a bit of a coincidence that this was in mice and mice are used most commonly in laboratories. And But it really is an interesting idea for the future. Now, I haven't read any papers on, on this that in a few so suppose suppose you were fighting an outbreak of a Ebola which was transmitting around the world. Now I know that's very unlikely because Ebola is transmitted by direct contact with body fluids. But suppose Ebola mutated and became a respiratory virus, then could you engineer an Ebola type virus which was very much less pathogenic but very much more transmissible? Release that to um, essentially uh, inoculate, uh, vaccinate. It actually, the, the correct word there is inoculate because you're actually giving the live virus to, to protect the world against something which is more dangerous. I haven't read any papers on that. If there is any science on that, let me know. Um, you guys seem to have invented that for yourselves. So <laughs> it's not any science I'm familiar with. So let me know. So in, in, interesting and great that you are uh, finding that, that interesting as well. Sorry, I'm prattling on for far too long. So uh, thank you for watching.